Professor Stefan Klein. It's a great pleasure for me, and I'm looking forward to hear your conference. Thank you very much, Teresa, for your kind introduction, and um, thank you to all the organizers for inviting me to this wonderful conference. And um, I would like to take the opportunities uh, just to make three points. First, happiness tells us something about our needs and capabilities. Second, you can train happiness. And third, happiness is not only an individual issue, but it's also a social issue. So my title is Towards the Science of Happiness, and you might ask yourself, when, um, can there be a science of happiness at all? And let me just ask you the question in a little different way, namely, what makes you happy? So I'll tell you what makes me happy. Um, for me, it's, for example, standing on top of a mountain on a clear morning. And it's, it's easy to understand why. You see, um, I grew up in the mountains in the Alps, and um, just seeing the mountains below me gives me a sense of um, really belonging to this world. And um, from you, having been born and raised at the seaside, it, it may be very different. You might feel a sense of infinity when you're standing at the beach and seeing the waves of the ocean rolling towards you. But, and this is important, we should not confound what makes us happy to the state of happiness itself. For we all may quite differ in what triggers our happiness. This depends on our culture, on our personal history, on our characters. But we all feel happiness in the very same way. So, how can we know this? Just look at that picture, and I like this picture a lot. Paul Ekman, a then young American psychologist, took it back in 1967 uh, on the highland of Papua New Guinea when the people this young man belongs to had virtually no contact with the outside world. So they lived as if on another star. And yet, you cannot communicate with him, he wouldn't understand you, but you understand immediately how he feels. Happy, he smiles. And when you show him a picture of a Portuguese child smiling, he would understand. And um, Ekman drew from that a bold conclu conclusion. And that was bold because um, in the 60s, people used to think that emotions and the way we express those emotions has been learned. And what Ekman said is, no, 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 that can't be true. The way we express emotions and the way we ultimately feel emotions is a human universal. It is innate. It is the same for all of us in no matter what culture. And this is the reason why there can be a science of happiness at all because we all perceive happiness in the same way. Um, and nowadays, of course, um, we have gone way beyond that. And um, today, we are not only able to look onto the faces of people as they have emotions, but right into their heads and see what goes on in the brain when we have certain thoughts and when we feel certain emotions. And um, I'm sure you all know the name of a man who made um, important contributions to that. He's been born in Lisbon, and it's um, Antonio Damasio. So um, when Damasio's um, lab down in America published um, those um, pictures in uh, 2000, oh, yes, in, in 2000, um, uh, they made a big splash. It was a, it was a big sensation. So what do you see here? You see horizontal and vertical cuts through brains of people who have been asked to um, imagine the saddest situation in their life. Does it 
You see a red point? No, I don't. Okay, doesn't matter. Okay, uh, the saddest on the on the right hand, and the happiest situation on the left uh, on on the right side. So uh, the um, um, saddest situation for most of them, of course, was the loss of a beloved one, and the happiest situation, well, you can guess it, falling in love, day of marriage, etc. And um, what you uh, what the coloured spots mean. Um, areas in the brain which are particularly active or inactive in that state. And what Damasio and his people found is that there is a consistent reaction in all humans with, in the brain with those feelings. I still find um, this graphic absolutely fascinating um, because even without going into the, de the details, which I have no time to do now, they can teach us three things. And the first one is maybe the most important. Yes, you can indeed measure happiness. Happiness has stopped to be a merely subjective state. It has an objective side. Second, happiness is a state of the whole brain and indeed of the whole organism. And um, if you read the popular press, this might come as a little surprise because um, you often um, read about the last center in the brain which goes off when you're feeling happy. And I'm sorry to say, the last center just doesn't exist. <coughs> Happiness, like all emotion, is a consequence of many parts in the, in the brain interacting in a very specific way. Third, um, these images can indeed resolve a long-standing debate in philosophy and psychology. Namely, um, is happiness just the opposite of unhappiness, as the name suggests? So, um, if I alleviate suffering, will people then be happy? And there are many philosophers who have thought so. And um, so do we think in our everyday lives, don't we? So um, uh, we think if some situation that is embarrassing us, um, like too much work or what, uh, whatever, um, just is over, we would be doing fine and be happy. Now, um, look carefully at those, at those pictures. If those would be true. If happiness would just be the opposite, the opposite of unhappiness, you would expect um, to be the activations as positive and negative of each other. But that's by no way true. And there are many more arguments um, to show that um, happiness is indeed a distinct state from happiness, that happiness is indeed a distinct state from happiness, a little bit like um, bitter and sweet, which aren't opposites either, um, which has two practical sides. The one practical side is, um, well, even if you alleviate happiness, if you, <laughs> even if you alleviate unhappiness, happiness won't come by itself. You have to do something for it, and this has consequences. And second, there can be happiness even in a miserable situation. Happiness and unhappiness do not completely rule out uh, each other. And, um, well, I mean, in a way, um, the culture of Portugal has always known that, with Saudade. <laughs> and I think um, it is really high time to take profit of um, such insights um, for clinical practice. And when I tell that to clinicians, um, well, I sometimes meet skeptical ears, which is understandable um, from the role model many clinicians um, still adhere to. Namely, they think, well, look, happiness is not of our behalf. We are here to heal suffering, but not to look for well-being. And I think um, this is dead wrong. And, um, a one and a very strong and beautiful argument um, why this is um, that wrong um, came from nobody other than um, Barry Brazelton this morning um, when he said, well, look, a very simple situation. The happier a parent, the better for a child. 
but we, I also think that we have a very real medical problem um, with happiness. Just look at um, this graphic. It shows um, th 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 those um, statistics from the World Health Organization, and it shows the years of lived with disability due to different disorders. And psychosocial disorders are green, leading the pack. And way the first of them all is unipolar depression. And what is really worrying about this is um, this is a population group from 15 to 45 years. So what we are currently seeing is a worldwide epidemics of depression. We, nobody knows exactly the reason. We just see that they are on the rise and the incidence is on the rise, it's on the rise. And it is hitting people earlier and earlier. And I think clinicians need strategies to prevention. So, let's reflect for a moment on what happiness is. What is happiness? And I could ask you, well, how do you become aware of happiness? And you would, of course, say, well, you know, I just feel it. Yes. And you are exactly right. Happiness, in the understanding of um, modern neuropsychology, is a feeling. And that's important. It is, it is not a lofty mental construct. It's not a cognitive thing. It is an emotion, a very down-to-earth reaction of your organism towards external stimuli or towards an internal in imagination. What are emotions good for? Well, emotions are signals, evolution devised, um, to show us situations that are potentially beneficial for us or potentially harmful to avoid. And with happiness, nature seduces us into behavior she wants from us. That's how Antonio Damasio put it very beautifully. So what does nature want from us? Um, well, you know, we need food for, for survival. We enjoy a good meal. Nature wants us um, to reproduce. Sex is obviously fun, but not only. Um, we enjoy caring for our children, at least most of the time. No man can live on uh, his or her own. We have warm feeling towards the persons close to us. What goes on when we feel happy, so I'm zooming in onto the brain now, certain neurohormones um, are released in our brains, and um, one of the, not the only one, one but one of the most um, prominent of those is that stuff I brought you here, that's, um, that's better endorphin, the name um, should be known to everybody um, who jogs as the responsible for the runner's high when the pain stops. And what's remarkable about um, endorphins is that they are chemically totally identical to opiates. They are opiates. They are identical to the substance that makes, um, well, opium, morphium, heroin work. You have a drug lab in your head and it's in the pituitary gland. And if you stop the action of those neurohormone, it is impossible to feel happiness at all. Now, I don't claim that happiness is just a molecule. Of course not. But it's important to understand what is necessary to be able to feel happy, and not only to feel happy, to get anywhere at all. Because um, if you stop the, um, or if you block the working of, um, of endorphins, you will soon find out that um, not only you are feeling miserable, that, but you don't have drive to do anything at all. You get nowhere. So, um, the ability to feel happiness is not just some luxury of nature, it is an 
absolutely essential for survival. And what then is the science of happiness? The science of happiness is the science of our need. Happiness is there to signal us our needs. And um, you see, a problem in the last couple of decades is that we have kind of restricted our understandings of our needs and hence our understanding of happiness by thinking that, um, well, happiness is about just what I can get and I'll be the happier the more I can get. So we acknowledge um, rightly, very rightly, material needs, needs for securities, maybe a little more esoteric, um, needs for personal growth, but um, we tend to neglect other needs which I think which are just as important as the desire we have for fairness or the desire to have to help other people. And we tend to treat them as kind of secondary needs, as non-innate needs, as kind of a matter of education that we have been, it's not part of our nature that at times we are generous and cooperative, but because we have been taught to be um, that way. And um, if you are working intimately with um, small children, as I suspect, um, as most of you are, um, you should have some doubts about it. And to fuel those doubts, um, I brought you a video of an experiment that was done at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig. This young man is one and a half years old. And look what he's doing. <laughs> did you see did you see the smile on his face at the very end he was happy to help he has not been told to do so in fact um, the, the, the children have been, this is from a whole series of experiments, and the children have been told to do anything. This is not a matter of fact that um, small boys, um, as we all know, love to open drawers and doors. Because um, when um, the scientists came in with books just under one arm and could have easily helped themselves, the children did nothing. Now, you see this behavior occurring spontaneously in boys and girls, absolutely no matter how those children were educated, and you would see this in any culture. And um, Michael Tomasello has been able to show this very convincingly. Um, and there is one conclusion, while well, that is quite evident. Obviously, the desire to help is not a secondary desire, but it's innate too. There may be something like genes for altruism, and if we are programmed this way, it is quite obvious um, why we get happy when we, uh, when we help, because with happiness, nature seduces us into behavior she wants from us. I think um, in the last decades, um, we kind of, deliberately or not, we have halved the picture of man and just have seen parts of it. And it's high time to see the whole picture of our capabilities, of our needs, and of our modes to find happiness. Which brings me to the next chapter um, of my talk namely the joy of anticipation, which, um, as you all know from the feeling of butterflies in your belly, is something quite different from um, the enjoyment after 
a need or something you want, it has been fulfilled. Happiness, after all, is not only there to signal needs to be fulfilled, but also to signal promises, promising situations. And indeed, we have a um, system dealing precisely with that, and it's um, and uh, the most important, again, not the only, but the most important neurotransmitter in doing so um, is dopamine, that um, tennis racket-like um, thing I brought you here. And um, dopamine and the dopaminergic system um, is indeed remarkable because um, dopamine, when it's being released, affects wide area I, it, it is no exaggeration to see um, uh, that it changes the working of your whole brain. It's a neuromodulator. And it does different things. So, um, first of all, and you can um, see it um, very vividly from uh, the faces of Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman, it directs our attention towards the, uh, towards the object uh, we desire. Second, it of course creates a sense of euphoria, but it does, importantly, um, do something more. And that's what um, Wolfram uh, Schulz, a neuroscientist now working in Cambridge, has taught us in the mid-90s. Namely, it gives us, it's a feedback system. It gives us feedback if an expectation has been met and then promotes learning which makes eminent sense. If my expectation about a restaurant here in Lisbon has been met, I'm well advised to remember the place and the restaurant for the next time of good food. And this, of course, doesn't um, work only with love and with restaurant, and not only with human primates, um, uh, but with other animals um, too. Um, just look at this um, chimp who is also looking um, for food, um, and he's very creative, isn't he? Um, he's using a stick that's tool use in animals. And it's the dopamine system which enables precisely that. Lust, curiosity, and learning are intrinsically interrelated. And you can turn it also the other way around. There is no learning without lust, but of course, as any scientist knows, insight makes you happy. And um, because um, I think that this finding from, from neuroscience has enormous implications to the way we deal in particular with children, I want um, to stay at this point um, uh, for a moment. So um, I zoom here into your brain. So this is a, this is a neuron, this is a gray cell. And um, in the background, and those are synaptic connections, interlinking neurons. And what is learning about? Learning is about the creation of new synaptic connections. You can imagine it as simple as that, as new concepts or movements, for example, get learned in your brain, new connections are created. And now what does dopamine do? Dopamine does precisely that. It sits here in green in the synaptic gap and it enables and helps with a formation of new connections in the brain. So creativity is in fact linked to positive and not to negative emotions. And I'm stressing that um, because there is a myth in our societies that you become creative and analytical and brilliant if you suffer, if you deeply suffer from the world. And it's just that. It's a myth. And I'd be happy to say more about that 
in the discussion. Um, uh, for the moment, um, I'd just like to make the point that um, you don't only see this from findings of um, fundamental neuroscience, um, but also from beautiful behavioral experiment. Alice Eisen in Cornell was a pioneer in doing so, and she indeed could show that a simple present or a compliment, like what a beautiful red blazer you're having today, makes you smile. It, it enhances your mood a little bit. And this is enough to not only improve for a short time, of course, um, your creative abilities, but also your analytical abilities. Positive emotions are there to promote learning and um, the um, Americans have a very um, fitting saying about this, namely your brain, your brain runs on fun. Your brain runs on fun. And what are we doing in our schools? We try to make our children learn through fear. Get this and that great Otherwise, horrible things will happen. Well, yes, it works. Um, but what a waste of talent. What a scandalous waste of talent. So, as I have talked about um, universalities for half an hour, let's turn to individual differences. Why are some people happier than others? If you work with babies, um, you know that um, already babies differ very much, and Barry Bresseton has said the word this morning, they differ in their irritability, and this is a clue to individual differences in happiness. Um, and um, Richard Davidson in Madison, Wisconsin, has studied that in a very rigorous way. Um, his way um, to irritate uh, babies um, was liquid. So um, on the tongue of one baby, he dropped a few drops of sugar water. And on the tongue of other baby, he used concentrated lemon juice. And, um, and then he looked what happened. And what he found is um, uh, some babies teased with the, longer, uh, with the lemon juice cry longer than others. They are more irritable also in other situations. For example, when uh, the mother leaves the room. Davidson now could show that um, this irritability correlates with a slight asymmetry in prefrontal brain activity. Namely, the less irritable babies had a slightly stronger activity on the left part of the prefrontal cortex. And later on, it was even um, possible to nail this dealing with positive and negative emotions in the different hemispheres of the prefrontal cortex up to individual neurons. The same is true for adults. And as we understand now quite well, there appears to be a connection from the left prefrontal cortex to older limbic structures, which is something like a switch off for negative emotions. People with a stronger hemispheric, um, a, a left side um, a prefrontal asymmetries are easier and what's important faster to control their negative emotions. Now you see this. Um, you see this in babies, um, where you would think that um, education can't play a big role, which made people think that indeed some are born grumpy, and others 
are born as happy minds. And um, uh, this is, um, uh, 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 well, this was the standard thinking 20 years ago. There is a happiness set point and you can do no matter what. You won't get happier, but unhappier either. And then came a surprise. W namely, when um, Davidson retested his former babies after 10 and 20 years. And what he found is that their affective style, as he would call it, their irritability has changed with many of them. And so has their um, prefrontal activity asymmetry. So quite obviously, there is a window for intervention, and as we know now, happily, that window for intervention gets narrower as we get older, but it never closes. Because in fact, the brain is rewiring itself to an extent that was um, unthinkable of two decades ago, until we die. And we indeed are um, now um, even able to see those structural changes. No, I'm sorry, we are not because the video doesn't work. I wanted um, to show you that you can indeed in in vitro experiments see how the structure of dendrites, that's um, what connects synapses to neurons, changes, can change within minutes. So, um, if you paid attention, um, your brain, after this conference, will virtually look a little different from this morning. In particular, if you pay attention not only to the thoughts the speakers are exposing here, but to your emotion. Because um, we also know that it's emotions which very strongly can trigger that plastic changes. Think of the connection of lust and learning. And even more so, um, if we are aware of these emotions, if we, if, I, if we direct our attention to them, if they become, as, you, as the Masio would say, feelings. And such emotions afterwards, in the long run, are being reinforced. And that means that we can, at least to a certain extent, tune our brains into positive emotions. Train our capabilities for happiness just as we can train to speak a foreign language or to ride a bike. And um, just with learning a foreign language or, um, or, or a sports or no movements, these changes take time and they take practice. And it's, they have a different difficulty for individuals. For, for me, it's quite easy to learn languages, but horribly hard to learn, learn movements, right? Um, uh, but still, I did learn eventually to l l l dance a waltz, but it took time. So, you can train happiness, and um, here's some neuroscience um, guided advice on how to do so. So we just talked about the most important, um, uh, the most important thing, namely mindfulness. Be aware of your emotions, both of your negative emotions as of your positive emotions. Become aware of your negative emotions, not in order to suppress them, as many think, but to control them. This is a very different thing. Controlling one's emotion means becoming aware of a situation that I'm, I'm angry, I don't want to be treated that way, and that's fine, 
but now it's a signal. I know the message now. The um, it, emotion has lost its use. And I can indeed direct my attention to something else. I'm not saying that this is always easy, but it can be trained. And uh, most of us, uh, uh, most of you um, will know um, that um, this is a highly effective intervention in adult psychotherapy. This is, of course, nothing else than cognitive um, psychotherapy. Um, fewer of, um, new, of you know probably um, that such strategies um, can routinely be used um, and taught to children. Martin Seligman has um, done just that in schools, and I think it is a very good idea. But again, this is only part of the coin. We are not only there to alleviate suffering, but to promote well-being. Become aware of your positive emotions in order to reinforce them. And um, Giovanni Fava, an Italian psychiatrist, has shown very convincingly that doing a simple thing like keeping a journal of your good moment indeed can help even depressed patients out of their situation. And of course, it works as well as with the non-depressed. And it works with children. Saint um, uh, Teresa from Avila um, was um, uh, very insightful um, when she asked people to be kind to your bodies in order to make the soul like dwell in them. And, um, and that is, of course, um, exactly right. Happiness is an enormously bodily um, emotion. And um, if we look to um, findings from um, social psychology, you consistently see that the people more satisfied with their lives move more. Be active. And in particular with children, foster their curiosity. So, this was the individual side of um, happiness, but I promised you to talk about the social side of it, and I think indeed we should, um, not only as um, Borussia um, at Dortmund might win the championship, uh, the, the, uh, the Champions um, uh, League, um, uh, there's a more urgent reason to that, namely the current um, political and economical situation. Thank so you. look at those gentlemen um, for a moment. They're obviously happy, aren't they? Um, are they happy because um, they won that ugly cup? <laughs> I doubt it. They are happy because they attained at a goal together and because hundred thousands are cheering with them. Yes, happiness has a lot to do with the fulfillment of our needs. This is obvious, but it, and that now ha has been overlooked, it does not only depend on what we get and how much we get, Importantly, it depends on how we attain a goal, how we get there. And this, of course, totally flies in the face of standard economical thinking. A 100 euro bill is there to make you happy, no matter how you got it. Well, that's how economists theorize. But as we can measure happiness now, um, let's make some experiments. And that has been done. Brain activation correlating with happiness are much stronger when two persons earn a euro together than when each one gets a euro alone. Happiness is community. And I should say, um, uh, the um, 
measuring of brain activity goes along very well with their subjective feeling. They say it satisfies me more. It is stronger when two persons cooperate to gain a euro than when they earn that money in competition. Happiness is cooperation. And it is stronger when they perceive a situation in which they got that money as fair. In fact, happiness is fairness. And you have to pay two euros to come in an unfair situation to create the same feeling of happiness um, that people have when they get one euro in a situation that perceive fair. You see, you can actually, you can save a lot of money by being fair. So, you see what the whole thing comes up to. In order to foster happiness in your organizations, in your communities, and in society as a whole, foster communities. Get away from that ridiculous idea that it's smart uh, to uh, remunerate people individually for their achievements. It doesn't work anyway, as we have seen. If you want to remunerate, try to remunerate communities. And indeed, um, excellent new German data done with some 10,000 Germans tracked in a, in a longitudinal study over 15 years showed that the single most important predictor for subjective well-being in life is not income, is not status, is uh, not the attainment of career goals, is not um, marriage status, etc., is not intelligence, but is something much simpler. Is the importance those people give to the well-being of others. So much for the altruistic genes. What is the second most important uh, predictor for subjective long-term well-being in that and many other studies? It has to do with the sense of autonomy. People perceive it as stressful when they feel they lose control over their lives, when they lose autonomy. And um, chronical stress, I need not say you, um, is not exactly helpful for, for well-being. And this is what worries me about the economic crisis so many um, countries at this time are in. It's not the loss of material income. This, people don't like that idea, of course not. I wouldn't like it either, but people adapt to it quite quickly. What worries me is the loss of autonomy and is, and is the loss of choices. And we should do everything to counter steer. And the third ingredient, of course, is meaning. To find a meaning in uh, one's acting is um, one of the strongest human desires of all. One's existential needs have been met. I think it is high time that we acknowledge that humans have moral needs as well as they, or as we, have material needs. And we should take those moral needs seriously. So, um, where would we get if everybody only did what he or she would find meaningful? So you see, uh, we're talking about a revolution here, aren't we? And um, happiness 
is not a pity concept. It has to do nothing or not much with my own little garden with high fences around it. We are talking about a revolution here, but about a revolution everybody can understand, nobody will have to suffer for, and which is going to foster well-being. I would like to close with a quote that is very old, that is from Epicurus, it is from more than um, 2,500 years old, but I think it is still very true that we should bestow great care on happiness because we have everything when it is present and do everything when it lacks. And I think precisely this is a challenge for you clinicians. Bestow this care upon your own happiness and upon the happiness of your fellow humans. Thank you very much.